we thank God for uh, Corpus Clinic this year. And we thank God for bringing us to this point uh, as we go on with the Lord. As the hymn and the, the hymn was coming to an end, my heart was just praying that God will indeed give us Christian hopes in our own generation. Generations that have gone before us, they've had the privilege of seeing God build stable homes, build homes that produce correct children, homes that produce a correct society, homes that gave workers to the society, gave correct politicians, gave correct leaders, homes that built men, uh, not homes that were all just struggling with them after they had gone to positions of authority. Once something has gone wrong with the home, something will eventually go, off, uh, go wrong with the society. Can you bow down your heads with me as we pray and as we go into the word of God uh, the first time during this couple's training? Father, we, our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. Please send your word to us. Send your word to us in this, our land, in this, our countries, in this, our generation. Lord, build for us correct homes again. Show us the principles. Lord, cause a revival to spring forth from within the homes. Cause a revival to spring forth from within families. Lord, let, let righteousness spring forth once again from our we believe you to do this for us in our, in our homes, in our communities, in our congregations, and Lord, in our generation. Do it for us in the name of Jesus. Thank you because we know you have heard us. You will speak to us expressly from your spirit. You will go beyond the words of my mouth and go to the hearts of your people. Uh, even those who know you and those who do not know you. All of us will encounter you afresh tonight. Do it, our Father. For we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, our theme for this year is dwelling together according to knowledge. Dwelling together according to knowledge. And um, our theme is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3. We will read 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll start with it. We will go to several other scriptures before we return to that passage as the Lord will grant us uh, grace tonight. First Peter chapter 3 from verses 1 to 8. Um, first Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God, uh, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy men, holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together uh, of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. 
Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. May the Lord bless his word to our heart in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, we, our emphasis this year is going to be on dwelling together according to knowledge. And maybe the first thing we want to look at first is what knowledge are we talking about? Are we talking about the knowledge of science or the knowledge of, uh, uh, of arts? Of course, we are not talking about those every kind of knowledge. We are talking about knowledge of the principles that run marriage, knowledge of the characters that are involved in marriage, knowledge of the establishment of marriage. That's what God said, that it needs knowledge for a couple to live together. It needs knowledge for a husband and wife to dwell together in, 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 in joy and harmony. I perceive that everybody that goes on to marry, they don't marry because they were planning to go and fight themselves. Nobody ever goes into marriage with an intention to beat his wife or with an intention to be rude and to fight her husband. Almost every wedding day, just a week or so ago, I was still in a wedding. And, I, and I, I sat down and I saw the husband and the wife were being joined together. I saw the joy in their faces. I saw the happiness. I saw the dancing. And I saw the husband looking into the uh, eyes of the wife. And when they asked him to give a toast, he spoke glowingly. He committed himself to his wife. He did this. He did that. And I prayed silently. I said, Lord, please help this young man to keep to what he has said. Help this young lady to be like this. But all of us know that many, many times things don't go like that for long. Things soon go sour. People begin to fight. Begin to, people begin to quarrel. And I know that it is not as if people married in order to scatter everything. Some marriages are scattered within the first one month of their coming together. I, I, I will not forget, I, I, I keep being amazed at an incident I, I, I witnessed. I was going to visit um, a friend and they told me I had gone to a, a wedding. So I was going to the wedding towards the tail end of that wedding. But in that reception, there were going to be two receptions one after the other. So one reception was finishing. There was another reception that was about to start. And the couple that was supposed to go in for that second reception, they were in the car as I walked past. Wonders of all wonders. They were quarreling so hard. They were fighting and abusing themselves. That's in between church and reception. I, 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 I couldn't, I could not bear it. I was saying, Lord, what is going on? What is happening to the institution of marriage? And I found out that most people that go into marriage, they go into marriage unadvisedly. They go into marriage without proper understanding. Marriage seems to be the only, only institution that people attempt to enter into without studying without finding out how it's to be wrong, without having the necessary preparation for that marriage. Even in the time past, our reverends and our pastors who join people together, they will insist that you must come for counseling and they will do this counseling over, the, the, over six months before the marriage. But what do we find now? People are too busy. They cannot go. They negotiate with the pastor. They negotiate with reverend. Sometimes they are telling the reverend, you know, I am the husband is working in Lagos, the wife is in a, in the in the US. She will only come in on the Thursday before the wedding. So there, there's no there's no way we can do counseling. Nobody goes into any correct thing, endeavor in life without finding out how is this supposed to run. On, on Saturday during the wedding. I had the reverend 
uh, who joined the couple together said, ah, now I'm going to give you the certificate of your marriage, um, uh, your wedding. And he said, marriage is the only institution that uh, they give you the certificate at the beginning. You have not yet done anything. You have not entered into it. Right at the beginning, they give you the certificate. Now, that may have deceived us into thinking that there is no need for preparation. There's no need for knowledge. There's no need for understanding before we go into such an estate. Simply because you were given the certificate at the beginning. And that certificate is not a proof of a correct marriage yet. It's just a proof of a legal journey. That is a certificate to begin, not a certificate that shows that you have ended well. And this has deceived many people. Several people have gone into marriage without the adequate knowledge, adequate understanding, without reading what is marriage all about, without getting set to find out how shall we do this? And knowledge is important in any area of life. I want to say to you that as a couple, you cannot make a success of your marriage if you do not take time to study and to prepare for a correct marriage. Let's begin from there. Let's settle it in our heart that this estate, when you go to a school, you read to get, your, to get a, a success. When you are working, they do repeated, what do they call that, in-service training. They take you for more certifications. They, 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 they improve you because things are changing. Things are improving. You are always reading. Almost every profession in life requires consistent, continuous reading and studying in order to make a success. Marriage is not an exception. The Bible says, and I want you to open your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24, I will read verse 3 to 6 quickly as we move ahead. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 3 to 6, through wisdom is an house builded, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. Yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel, thou shalt make your war. And in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Can you imagine that even in warfare, you study, you study your opponent, you study your resources, you, you strategize, you need wisdom. I want to first of all impress upon you as we go on in this couple's clinic that you are not doing yourself good. If you think that just the normal knowledge that you pick as you are growing up, knowledge you pick from watching families around you, knowledge you pick from watching your parents, knowledge you just picked, you pick on the way unconsciously, they are not sufficient to have a successful marriage. It takes wisdom to build a house. It takes understanding to fill your life with correct things. If you are intending to enjoy your marriage, you are intending to enjoy your coupling together as husband and wife, if you are intending to enjoy your children, to have children that will give you satisfaction, you have, to, you have to acquire the relevant, requisite kind of knowledge that will produce such a family. I want to say to you that there is no, mar no home, no correct home that happens by accident. There is no marriage that happens by chance. Correct marriage. If you see a successful, happy family, Things are going fine. The children are doing well. They are well behaved. They are doing well in life. I want to assure you, somewhere, somewhere, somebody in that family took time to study, study the relevant things as we are going to be seeing now. And then he took time 
to apply the things that he studied to make that family work. The Bible says every house is built by somebody. No house happens by chance. No house happens by accident. Every correct home is a, a result of deliberate and conscious building. Building with God, of course, as we are going to be saying as we go on. Con con conscious. A conscious taking your family and building your family to be what you plan it to be. And as I say this, particularly, I would like to speak to the husband that the head of the family is very important. Once you have an absentee head of the family, the family cannot, I, I'm just wondering what the body can do without the head. A headless man is dead. A headless home is dead on arrival. A husband who is away, who is not in charge, who is not in tune, who is not doing something consciously, that home cannot be correct. That home cannot do well. There is no, there is no uh, magic about it. Just the same way that somebody cannot just enroll in school, be trans, is not available in school for teaching, for learning, is not available to, to, to do relevant tests, is not available for anything serious, and then at the end of the day, he hopes to pass his exam. That will be madness. And unfortunately, many homes are run like this. Let me ask you as a husband, are you prepared to be the head of your home? As a wife, are you knowledgeable? Do you know what it takes to wife a husband? Do you know what it takes to lead about a wife as a man? Do you have capacity built already to take your wife by the hand and lead her into success, lead her into a, an enjoyable future? Most people are very quick to, uh, to, to blame one another. But if each member of the home decided that my own home is going to be a correct place, by the grace of God, we have seen it happen over and over again. Marriage can be sweet. Marriage can be wonderful. Marriage can be what God designed it to be. Marriage can fulfill all the hopes, the aspirations, the, the, the joy with which the couples go into it. Marriage can give us each of these things by the grace of God. And therefore, as I go into the word of God, I've been talking about knowledge. I'm talking about wisdom. I've been talking about preparing yourself. This is not abstract. And I'm not just talking about reading widely and reading all sorts and manners of books of marriage. More so now that there are many books outside there that have no bearing to the word of God. Many so-called knowledge outside there that have no bearing. They are completely opposite to the word of God. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. Quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, Brother Paul was speaking and he spoke to the he wrote to the Corinthians. He said, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in witness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my uh, preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of of this world, nor of the princes of this world that comes to none or comes to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So when we are talking about knowledge, are we just talking about any kind of knowledge? Am I just telling you to go and buy books 
books on psychology of women, psychology of men, go and gather marriage books from wherever and pour it all on your head and force your wife to read it in order to have a successful home. I may not be able to guarantee that every book you will read will point you in the direct, uh, correct direction. But I can guarantee you that the one who started marriage, the one who originated marriage and who gave us the manuals with which to live marriage, he has the correct recipe for a successful marriage. Brother Paul said, when we speak, we are not speaking with enticing words of man's wisdom. There are a lot of men's ideas about marriage these days. There are books, motivational books, psychology books, um, even textbooks that attempt to prostitute how to run your marriage. And every time you read, I, 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 sometimes I have taken time to read some of these books because I thought maybe I could gain some things in there. And sometimes I take a motivational book. Everything is positive. Everything is, is, is hopeful. Everything is talking as if there will be no storms in the marriage, as if everything is just going to keep going, keep going. But I want to ask anybody who has married here to come and tell me whether every marriage that, since the years you have married, whether things have always been the way you wrote, read it in some of those motivational books, some of those positive thinking books. But as I look at the word of God, Brother Paul said, the words of man's wisdom, they are enticing. Yes, they are sugar coated, they are sweet. When you read them, you feel heavy, you feel happy, you feel high. Yes, yes, yes. But I want to tell you, they haven't worked. I read books before I got married. I read books that, 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 that told us that uh, women, money, money can change everything about women. That once you just give a, a woman money, everything that is worrying her has finished. If I speak according to our local proverb, they said, that is all that a woman knows is money. And I thought that, uh, honestly, once I have money in my pocket, then I will be able to uh, control my wife. I'll be able to have a submissive wife. I want to disillusion you. Money never makes women submissive. Or cooperative. I want to tell you, not just women, even men, money never satisfies. There is no amount of money. She may be happy with you for giving her one million naira now, and she will, she will be happy. Oh, especially if you make it dollars and make it hard currency. Oh, she will dance. She will give you a pet. Just watch out. It doesn't take more than 24 hours. All of that will finish. Reality will dump back on her. Let's even say it lasts one week. She will soon be back at grand level. That's not her normal level. That's an excited level, excited by dollars. I've read books that told wives that uh, the road to a man's uh, heart is through his mouth. Anytime you want to get something from your wife, just prepare the best meal. Arrange a candlelight. Put candle on the table. Put ribbon on your hair. Dim the lights of the room and speak in a sonorous voice. Let me ask you, wives, has it worked? Even if it worked the first time and it caught that man and that man gave you what you wanted, do you think that men are that foolish? The next time he comes in and he sees the light dimmed and he saw a he say, ah, I know you. I know you are looking for something. And he already closed his heart if he doesn't plan to give you anything. They don't work. Those are enticing things. They're enticing principles. But they don't work. They are not being tested. They are not, they are not tested. I have found by the grace of God certain principles from the word of God that worked. They work. I've seen it work. In 32 years of marriage, I have experienced both sides. I have tried some of those things that I read in books and I saw where they carried me. And by the grace of God, when I encountered 
the biblical teaching of the word of God by the grace of God uh, under the hands of uh, the man of God that has become my disciple today. He took us by the hand, showed us some of these principles. And we can, we, our marriage is a product of biblical principles. It is these principles that have worked in our lives. That's what we hope to present to you this weekend. It takes the word of God to produce the joy that the word of God promises. Anything short of that will not produce the same result. Anything short of that will not, will not give you the joy and the hope, uh, the excitement you are hoping for. Anything short of the principles of the word of God, they are completely opposite. And as I go on, let me, let me, let me tell you again that the principles you will find in this world, worldly principles, worldly books, worldly narratives of how to run a home, how to run a marriage, if you look at them and compare them side by side with the principles of the word of God, they are completely opposite. I will not deceive you. The principles that we walk, that will give you the joy and the satisfaction you are looking for. I don't care which country you live in. I don't care what you are listening to on your radio and the television or what you are browsing on the internet. The principles, most of the things you will see there, they will not give you a correct hope. There's only one authentic source of a correct marriage. Only one authentic source of a happy family, the word of God. Only one authentic source of a family, father, mother, children that are happy, that are contented, that are together, they are cohesive. I have only found one source and that is the manufacturer's manual. He who made them at the beginning, who made them male and female, wrote the Bible for us to know how to operate marriage. I want to inform you that the principles of the world and the principles of God, they are opposite. They are diametrically opposed. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. The gospel according to St. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus was talking. He said, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. <laughs> the day I, I stumbled on this scripture, it was wonderful. They said, the things that are highly rated, the principles that are carried, if I were speaking in my language now, it would have been very easy for me to explain. In, in Yoruba language, he said, you carry it, ge -ge 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 -ge, as if you carry it with, with value. You carry it with, with honor, with respect. The Bible says the things that are highly esteemed among men, if you go and ask God, they are an abomination in the sight of God. The principles of marriage, you will read in books, you will read on the internet. If you go and ask God and say, excuse me, sir, I read this on the internet. They told me like this. They said this is how I should handle my wife. This is how I should do my, my children. They say I should just uh, put toys in the room of my children and put a television and give them internet on demand. Occupy them. Give them cartoons to watch. Give them technological toys. That's what they are saying, how to raise your children now. If you go to God, God will say, honestly, if I tell you the truth, that is a bad thing to do. That's an abomination. What's the meaning of abomination? Something detestable. I hope that's not a bigger English. Something, something that doesn't, that smells, that repels God. Because these are your principles. They won't achieve what I want. The things that are highly esteemed, highly honored among men, the Bible says they are an abomination. So if you will want your marriage to do well, if you want your marriage to settle down, if you want your marriage to, to work, 
you will have to settle down with me for us to look at the word of God. And lastly, as I'm, I'm looking at that before I move ahead, I want to read to you again what the Lord Jesus Christ said about this topic. When they confronted him in Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees, they gathered themselves. The Bible said they were tempting him. They, they wanted to test him. They, were, they wanted to, like we say here, they wanted to, it's like uh, push him forward. That's not good English, but uh, you may have the understanding of what I'm talking about. They just want to, they want, they want to see what he will say. So they came with a seemingly hard question to Jesus. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. I'm not del delving into this Bible passage yet. I just wanted you to see what Jesus, how Jesus answered them. When they spoke all the big, big questions of marriage, hey, if my wife offends me, don't I have a right to, to, to divorce her? If she does this, if she does that, the other day I read a story on social media of a, a wife that uh, slapped her mother-in-law during the wedding reception. She's, the wed mother-in-law was asking for food or something like that. And then she felt it was an unreasonable uh, request and she refused. The mother-in-law said, ah, can't you give me food from your side? Um, some people have not eaten. And in the heated argument, the mother-in-law slapped the bride. And the bride looked, 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 looked and wiped her face back. And the husband said, eh, you slap my wife on your wedding day and my mother. You slapped my mother on my wedding day. The husband kept quiet. She, he didn't talk. One week or so after, she went to file for divorce. They said, why? Uh -uh. Everybody started begging. He said, no, if she can slap my wife and uh, my mother, she doesn't want this marriage. And that was the end. Under one month. In fact, to tell the truth, the marriage had ended before, the, before 24 hours. Do we have a right to divorce, to push away our wife for every reason? What if she commits adultery? Like the woman that was caught in adultery and they took to Jesus and said, look at this woman. She was caught in adultery in the very act. I never cease to ask. If you caught a woman in adultery in the very act, was she committing adultery with herself? Where is the man that she committed adultery with? They did not grab the man. It was the woman they grabbed. And they were going to stone her to death. Can we not do away with these women? These women necessary evils. Somebody said a woman is the woe of men. I honestly, your wife will be a woe to you if you don't do it with her according to knowledge. And it will not be because she's designed to be a woe, but because you don't know what it takes to husband a wife. You don't know what it takes to father a homestead, father a household. You don't know what it takes to build a correct family. So when they have brought all the questions to Jesus, is it lawful? I thought Jesus would have said, you know, this kind of question should have been yes or no. But I've been watching my master as I study the scriptures. He hardly answers these questions with yes or no. And I would like to tell you, marriage questions are never yes or no. There are issues involved. There is knowledge necessary. There is understanding needed. We must hear the whole story before we double into it. Somebody cannot just bring a question and say, hey, can you imagine a woman did like this? Hey, look at what husband did to me. And you open your mouth and you start judging. You are asking unadvisedly. Jesus doesn't do like that. And I, 
it was Jesus' first response that interests me this evening. He said, and he answered and said unto them, have you not read? Let me just stop there. To have a successful marriage requires you to read. You have to read. Brother, sister, you have to study. You have to find out the principles that make marriage work. You cannot just go anyhow, anywhere, anyhow into marriage and think that it will succeed anyhow. You just think that, well, you learn on the job. Yes, you learn on the job of marriage. I agree. But there are certain things you need to know before you enter or else you have entered wrongly. And once the first principles are wrong, once the foundation are destroyed, the Bible says, what can the righteous do? So Jesus said, have you not read? And when he said, have you not read? He meant read the Bible. Because he said, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made them male and female at the beginning. The one who originated marriage. What did he say? How did he expect marriage to be wrong? These are all principles that you need to find out before you enter into marriage by the grace of God. Now, I perceive that I have uh, uh, spent enough time to persuade you to look for relevant, requisite knowledge, understanding of the word of God for your marriage to work. Internet principles will not work. The books you read from these celebrated, so-called celebrities, celebrities who, whose marriages break down within a year, within three years. Some of these celebrities are so unashamed to talk about their fourth, their fifth husband. And they speak without shame on social media, on the telly. Those are the people you are trying to, to read their books. Those are the people that you are following their principles. I dare say to you, your marriage will end the way their marriage ended. That's not a cause. That's just the truth. If you face a direction, you will arrive at the destination at the end of that direction. It's just normal. If you walk in line with principles, that have been proven to fail one, two, three, four, five, six times, and you are going on that direction. The least that can happen to you is that it will fail one time. Maybe you may get tired and not do again. So that's why it may not continue. But if you want to have a home that is doing well, then you need to read the manufacturer's manual. Praise the Lord. So, I would like us to go back to our first Peter chapter 3 now as we begin to study. And whatever little that we are able to, stop to uh, study tonight, we will stop there and then we will continue by God's grace tomorrow as we are studying, dwelling together according to knowledge. Incidentally, I have been reading this Bible verse many, many times. I've even preached on it a number of times. And every time I get to that verse 7, when he says, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. And then he goes on to recommend. I used to think that this knowledge here means knowledge of the husband and knowledge of the wife. Knowledge of uh, how women behave, how men behave, which is true, actually. We need knowledge of, because he that made them at the beginning did not make them male and male. He didn't make them female and female. He made them male and female. Yes, the male is different from the female. The female is different from the male. We need an understanding of what the male is different from the female. We need an understanding of how to approach men, how to approach women, and we will have a success. Yes, we need that understanding. But as I studied that Bible verse again, 
I suddenly saw the word likewise. And I said, ah, you cannot say likewise when what you want to say is not connected with something that you have said before. So I went all back and I went to verse one and I was surprised to find the word likewise again. Ah, I said, what is, what is this? So I saw that before he started talking to the man and talking about the knowledge of how to handle a home, he had already, first of all, talked to the woman, the requisite knowledge of how to handle a home. So the knowledge that he's talking about primarily here in this context is not the worldwide principles of knowledge about everything. He has stated the knowledge, the basic knowledge that is required to run a home for both the husband and the wife. For both the head of the family and the body who is supposed to be the helper. He has taken time to state both for both parties the requisite knowledge that they need to run their home and succeed. And I want to say to you, there are very few principles of marriage that are cardinal. This one that we are looking at tonight is one of the most cardinal principles of knowledge and of uh, marriage. And did this principle that we are about to look at here is building on several other foundational principles, which for sake of focus, I may not double into them tonight, but this is called the basic principles of marriage. The basic principles of relationship in marriage. This is the knowledge that a woman needs to know if she's going to have a successful uh, home. And this is the knowledge that a husband needs to know and take care of if he wants to have a successful marriage. And we are going to look at it quickly and pray that God will grant us speed to be able to look at both sides in a concise manner as we take, go to the place of prayer tonight. First Peter chapter 3, I will read from verse 1 again. He says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation, by the, by the behavior of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, this is the way that women of old, um, holy women of old also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husband. Let me stop there. We will go gradually. So what are we talking about by the grace of God tonight? And I want you to listen to me, whether you are young or you are old, old in marriage. Whether you are newly wedded or you've been in at least for 30 years, like I have been. This, this word of God is the principle that will make a successful marriage. And I see here that the Bible speaks to the woman first. Incidentally. I checked all the places where the Bible spoke to the family, where they spoke to husband and wife, whether it's First Peter or it's Ephesians chapter 5, 6, or uh, uh, Colossians chapter 3. I saw that in each of those passages, the Bible speaks to the woman first. 
It's as if, if a woman can be correct, no matter how hard the husband is, that husband can be one. That husband can be like my wife would say when she's preaching on this, you can have your husband literally almost eating out of your hand. He will love you. He will be available for you. He will allow you. He will take care of you if you can do this one thing. And what is that one thing? It looks to me as if it is not any other thing that wins a woman in marriage apart from the behavior of the wife. The demeanor of the wife. The way the wife carries herself inside that marriage, that is what breaks the backbone of the man and makes the man, I know men can be stubborn, like uh, my disciple will say, there seems to be one tendon at the neck of a man that makes him to do his head like this. And when they are, when they say, no, I will not have that from you. That tendon will be broken if this wife does what this Bible is talking about. Verse 1 says, there are some men that will not be broken by preaching. No matter how much the pastor shouts in church, sometimes when the pastor is preaching, you'll be seeing some wife be telling yourself, I hope you are hearing. I hope you are hearing yourself. I hope you are hearing they are talking to you. Madam, you are pushing that man farther and farther away from you because what you are doing is the direct opposite of what is going to win the man. Sometimes some men are not overpowered by the word of God. As powerful as the word of God is, the will of man can be so strong, but the Bible seems to recommend that there is something that can break the will of a husband. He said, if you have your own husband, and you submit, you are in subjection to that husband. Even if he doesn't listen in church, without your talking at home, you can win that husband. What pastor did not succeed to do in church, you can do at home, in your bedroom, quietly. And the Bible says, your while they behold, verse 2, your chaste conversation, your, your, your pure conversation, coupled with reverence, the fear there is not like the fear of snakes or the fear of a bad person. It talks about reverence. It talks about respect. And I know again, somebody is saying, hey, they have started. Yes, submit. That's what they will say. That's what we can say because that's what the Bible says. That's what the word of God says. And I know that people are telling you somewhere outside that you cannot allow a man to put your head underneath him. There are many ways we talk in Nigeria that is very descriptive. When they want to talk about subjection or subdu subjugation, they say they have, they have put your head under. They have put your head underneath their tie. Don't listen to them, those preachers. They just want to subject you to your husband so that your husband can use you like footmat. I know. I know the enticing words of man's wisdom tells you, no, the way to overpower your husband is to empower yourself. Go and get your own money so that he cannot make noise about you. He cannot ride you anyhow. Make your own money. She makes, uh, he, she, he makes his own money. Then you meet in the middle. And now you put your everything on the table. And then you can discuss. Let me ask those of you that have been doing it. Has he given you the happiness you are looking for? Except for most husbands, you know what they do? They say, oh, is that what you want to do? No problem. Two can play at that game. He, he goes to the middle line with you on the table. And he does what you want with you. But then outside, he's doing many things. He's wrecking your home outside. He's having so many spare tires outside. And then in the end, you are going to be unhappy. Let me say this to you. Are you a woman? I hope you are listening to me. 
I have I've been preaching for quite a number of years now, several decades now, by the grace of God. And I've counseled with many women everywhere I go. One thing, one thing strikes me so seriously. Every time I meet successful women who come for counseling, they may be rich, they may be established, they may have money, they may even have position in, in, in the community. When they settle down with the man of God for counseling, they always have one, only two things in their mind. If their husband is not loving them, they cannot be happy. Number two, if their children are not doing well and they are not taking care of them, they cannot. I'm, I'm telling you, nothing else satisfies a woman towards the end of her years. Young lady, I know you are, you are doing spirit, like they say, everywhere now. You are driving your car. You are making a younger. Yes, you are doing this. My husband can do this. I'll do my own. Because you are young. There's coming a time when you are going to, the manner of women will come upon you. There's coming a time when the reality of having misused your youth will come upon you. And then in your secret, secret discussions in the night, you'll be asking yourself, God, if I had known, I would have made my different choice. Too many examples I could have been giving you. I read the story of a well-accomplished woman who is celebrated everywhere, who was being interviewed. And then they said, if I mention her name, some of you will know her. And then they said, Madam, do you have any regret in life? He said, oh. He said, if there's something I can change, I will have given away this career, this popularity, this uh, success in the public life in order to have gained my home. Now, my husband is away everywhere. Unfortunately, my daughter has followed my wayward steps. She, and I know she's going to end up the way I ended up. Then as if she caught herself. He said, it's not as if things are bad, that one. But I said, oh, I have seen it. I've had the truth. I've had the truth. That's the truth. The Bible says there's something that breaks a husband. Something that can make you be won by, that make you win your husband. It is not women empowerment. I believe in empowering the home and if that includes empowering the woman with something to do, I am not against it, but not as a means of independence from your husband. Not as a means of winning your husband. It will never work. You will have more money, but you will have less happiness. You have less joy. You have less peace of mind in the home. The Bible says, even if they are not won by the preaching of the word, they will be won by the conversation by the manner of life. And they told us what that manner of life is. Look at verse 6. I'm coming back to look at verses 3 and 4, but permit me to jump to verse 6. He said, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, you do well like your mother, Sarah. And Sarah is a, is a, it's a good, a, 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 a wonderful experience, um, example of a woman to look at. She called her husband Lord. Of course, small letter L, Lord. Not as if she worshipped, she was worshipping her husband. Not as if she was, a, she was a, you know, cringing and begging down and bowing down. No. If you read the story of the two of them, you see that Sarah was a, she was a, a resourceful woman. That's a woman that held a household, a household that pro, pro, produced 318 soldiers, not 318 people. Abraham had 318 men that he could arm and go and fight a war. These men will have wives, they have children. That household could not have been less than 1,000 people. 
Her compound was so large. That's a resourceful woman. She was not a mean woman. To handle that kind of household without quarrel, it's not a mean achievement. But whenever she turns to her husband, if she turns to the rest of the household, she's the king, she's the queen of her home. But when she turns to her Lord, she knows that that's the Lord. That's her husband. That's the head of the clan. And she will not do anything. Even when uh, the, Abraham went and misbehaved and married the second wife and brought a, 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 an Egyptian and uh, she was not happy. She still did not take laws into her hand. You see her still going to her husband. Excuse me, sir. This, this small girl that you are married on top of me, she's misbehaving. It was until her, girl, her husband said, it's all right, deal with her the way you like. That was when she, she, she could do anything. She took permission for any, everything. The height of this relationship of submission to a husband is a height. Honestly, it's a height. Even me, when I look at it, I say, wow, this is the height of it. The husband said, we are going to enter this country now. And you know the people we are going to meet, they are terrible people. They can kill a man because of his wife. And you know you are very pretty. So you will need to agree with me. Say you are my sister. So that they will not kill me. And she agreed. I'm, I'm really wondering how she agreed. She agreed. But you are going to see that women who have this kind of mindset, they have another power they use. They are not made, God is not planning for them to become footmat for their husband to ride upon anyhow. They have another power. They have something they utilize first their behavior, their conversation, their manner of life, the way they submit to their husband, the way they treat him as king, the way they make him feel happy and feel okay, feel good. And they got their way. And I, I've been married for <laughs> several decades now. And I, I, I have a wife. And I know the difference. When she was not like this, I know how I was to her. And when she found this truth and she turned to it, I also know how I am today. I know many times I say, my dear, ah, ah, this way you are, you are, you are, this way you are making your husband to just do everything you want like this. What is happening? I know what is happening. She's doing what God says she should do. And it, 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 I've not become stupid. I've not become a, a baby. And I've not become, I've not become mad. But actually to take a madman to just be beating a wife that is submissive in the house every day. It will take a madman. If two of us, if uh, a man, let's assume that a man is annoyed with his wife. And the man said, you like this? Why do you do like this? And he slapped the woman. What? If the woman said, yeah, 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 and she ran away from the room and went out and said, please come and help me beg my husband. Let me ask you a question. How many slaps will she receive? I know you got it correctly. Only one. But suppose he said, eh, you can slap me. You think I'm a fool? I will also do my own. And she grabbed the man by the beard. And punched. She cannot fight. She doesn't have strength. But she can tear his clothes. She can do like this. Let me ask you, how many slaps, how many boxes will she, re will she receive? Several. That's just the basic principle. When a woman submits, the man loses the impetus to fight. And it's not just, let me tell you, this principle is not just for marriage. It's for everything in life. You don't subdue an already subjected person. No. It is only somebody who is fighting that you subdue. 
the stubbornness of a man, the, 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 the domestic violence that we see today, let's go and check it. Even the woman that is being beaten, she is fighting, she is fighting. If she were not fighting, that will not, be, I can assure you, if she say, oh, my husband, I'm sorry. I didn't know that that's what you wanted. He said, you don't know what it is. Are you stupid? He said, I'm sorry. And she went on her knees and she's begging. Even if the man is the maddest, angriest man, the worst he can do is to angrily walk out. He will not beat that woman. But sometimes some women cannot fight with their hands, but their mouth is very sharp. They can talk. If their husband says ha, they will say ha, ha, ha. And then we are all shouting domestic violence. Am I exonerating men who beat their wives? Obviously not. But I am talking to women to give you the panacea to it. Why not exonerate? I'm not exonerating a man. By the grace of God, I've been married to my wife for over 32 years. I've never raised my hand once. Not once. Even my children. None of them, I'm not beating any one of them after the age of 10 or 11. I think one, I beat one at the age 11 because he did something different that I needed to correct. That's not the issue. We're not talking about men who show their power physically. Any man who stands or who the only way he can overpower a woman is by beating her is a weak man, honestly. There are stronger ways to overpower a woman. And we are going to be looking at it uh, very, very quickly. So let me not spend the whole of the time talking about women because I have to talk about likewise ye husband before I stop today. But let me um, uh, summarize this by telling you, madam, I, I, I don't want to deceive you. I want to help you. I want to make you enjoy your family. You have tested fighting and rebellion for the number of years that you have married to your husband. Test this other side and see. Do something different. If you are doing something in a particular way and you are getting a particular result and you don't like the result you are getting, somebody said it is madness to continue to do what you are doing to get a wrong result and hope to get a right result. I'm just pleading with you. I'm praying that God will get through to you. God will get to your heart and make you to see, okay, let me try God. Let me test the Bible. I know that submission has been preached and over preached, maybe mispreached, but can I tell you the truth? It is still the only way to enjoy your home as a wife. There is no other way. Every other thing is on top of this that we are talking about. If a, man, a woman's behavior at home is that of confrontation and competition, eh? the Yoruba word for competition is to figure, to use your hand to, to hit one another. If that is what you are doing in the home, sorry, there is no hope of enjoying that marriage. You will go from one man to another man to another man without getting it right. The truth is the truth. A woman that wants to win her husband. Would you like to win your husband? You can win your husband by the couple, by the, by the behavior, by your behavior that is coupled that is hand in hand with fear. Sarah agreed to Abraham's preposterous, you know, proposition. And for that, she was going to be taking the king sent for her. Ah, pretty woman, I will marry you. Chebi, you say you are your husband's sister. Uh, yes, I am. I, I am his sister. Ah, fine girl. And he took him into his palace. And you see how God dealt with the issue. Let me say this before I go away from this because uh, I don't want to leave it in, in hanging. When a woman submits 
to her husband. She releases the powers of heaven. She releases divine discipline to deal with her husband. When she does what God says she should do, she releases God to do what only him can do to all of his creatures. That your husband is not too hard for God to handle. The problem is that you have never allowed God to handle him. You have always wanted to handle him yourself. You have never allowed God to do what only he can do. You have always wanted to do what even you cannot do well. And this last scripture I'm going to read uh, before I leave the matter of the women is in Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter, I think it's chapter 10. And it's a popular scripture that we quote whenever we are dealing with the devil, at least those of us who are born again, Pentecostal, that we want to deal with the devil, we say the weapons of our warfare from verse 4 are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Would you like to bring every thought in your husband's mind to the obedience of Christ? Let's show, let us see the, 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 the secret. Look at verse 6. He said, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Madam, when will your husband be conquered? When you do what God said you should do. A woman that submits to her husband is not left at the mercy of the husband. We are not saying that the, husband, the, the wife should become threshing clothes for her husband to march upon anyhow. That's not what we are talking about. Because every woman who submits releases heaven to fight for them. God says, I am ready to revenge all the disobedience of your husband. When? When your own obedience is fulfilled. Madam, for once, obey. Obey God and submit to your husband. And then wait and watch to see what God will do with your husband. And even if your husband is not a hard-hearted fighting husband, but because you know every time, when you do like this, he will get afraid. Then he will say, it's okay, oh, ah, so that there will be peace in this house. Whatever you want, I have it to you. Madam, I want to say to you, you are not enjoying that home. You are not enjoying that husband at all. Submit and see how even the same man that looks meek, how he will spring up and the husband inside of him will come out. You have not seen the husband inside of me. You have only seen the man that you have cowered. And you are put to one side. Even when you succeeded in shouting your husband down and you succeeded, I'm telling you, you are losing something. You are not enjoying your home. You are not enjoying marriage. That's not how marriage is supposed to be. And I know you are not happy because you are always on guard. I must not give him any space to rebound. You're always this. You're always that. You're always doing this. That means you are not enjoying what God wanted you to enjoy. If only, then you will see that husband. You will see. So what is the reason why we say women should submit? It is because God comes in divine discipline. I will read that verse. Let me read it in Living Bible as I go away from this now. Living Bible. First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, I will read verses 5 and 6. In the Living Bible, we said, these weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. With this weapon, I can capture rebels and bring them back to God and change them into men whose heart's desire is obedience to Christ. That's what he said. Look at verse 6. 
I will use these weapons against every rebel who remains after I have first used them on you yourselves and you surrender to Christ. God is waiting to use these weapons of the word of God on you yourself. When that has happened, God will use it on your, your husband. And if it is the husband that needs to do this first, for God to do it, use the weapons on his wife, it works vice versa. But let's go on to the husband as I am drawing towards the end of this message. Go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 again. 1 Peter chapter 3. When am I supposed to start? All right. Now, the Bible says in verse 6, no, verse 7, likewise ye husbands, According to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Then he said, Finally, be you of all one mind. Let, let's deal with the husband quickly. What is the knowledge that the husband needs to know? What knowledge is God talking about? What is the basic understanding that a man needs to have towards his wife? He said, give honor to the wife as unto a weaker vessel. Honor the wife. Honor the wife. Care for her. Rest you know, we're talking about submission. Now, God talks to the husband about honor that has to do with respecting and understanding her makeup. Honor, that's why the Bible says, husband, love your wives. In the word love, it contains the word honor. Whoever you love, you will honor. But specifically here, the husband is, uh, the Bible is saying, the husband should dwell with the wife as if he's dead dwelling with a weaker vessel. What do we, how do we treat weaker vessels? And I want you to just uh, do some little uh, uh, thinking about vessels in your house. When you have a vessel that is made of iron, you throw that vessel anyhow. In fact, if mommy is washing plates and a little girl, four or five years of age, say, mommy, mommy, let me help you to wash your, let me help you to wash your, your plates. Will mommy carry her china wear or those breakable, very costly and very delicate and beautiful plates Will you give it to a small child to handle? Definitely not. Her mommy will say, thank you very much. Ah, no, no. I know the kind you can wash. You can wash. They either give them the iron plates of those days, or these days they don't do iron plates again. Give her plastic. So that even if it falls down 20 times, there's no problem. You can pick it up. A wife is not plastic. A wife has their composition is weaker than our own. We can break that woman. You can destroy that woman. You can injure her easily. She's breakable. She's, I think the best word that you use is she's delicate. Delicate and valuable. She's something, someone that needs to be carried with care. You need to be conscious of not breaking her spirit. And you see, this has very little to do with physical strength. Don't let me say it has nothing to do. It has a little to do with it because most women are generally weaker than their husband. That's why the husbands are always beating them anyhow. But I have seen women that are, <laughs> that are stronger than their husbands. Too. So this matter is not, is not physically low. And even women that look as if they are weak. Ah, I don't know how to explain it to you. Sometimes I look at my wife and I see strength. I see a kind of physical strength that sometimes I think I don't have. 
Both of us have gone to church. We have gone to service. We have traveled. We have come back. By the time I'm coming back, I'm fagged out. I collapse into the chair. But then she enters the house. And I see she has just woken up in the morning. She springs into action. She goes to the kitchen. She's arranging this. And I say, ah, my dear, I'm sorry. I'm tired. I can't join. He said, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm coming. Then he's managing this. He's pulling this. He's doing this. He's doing that. And in another 30 minutes or so, she's inviting me to come and eat. And I say, ah, my dear, say, sorry, I could not help you. And this, this, this. But she doesn't even look as if she's, she's tired. As the husband is pulling her here, children are pulling her there, and yet she's going to work. She's doing this, she's doing that. Honestly, many women are strong. Their strength may not be in, in terms of a punch. Their strength is in resilience. Their capacity to keep going, even when they are tired. Many times they beat us men flat-footed on that, on that, uh, in that regard. But this scripture is not talking about physical strength. It's talking about, for me, it's talking about their spirit. It's talking about their inner man. You know, I jumped at Donny uh, the other time in, when I was talking about women. The, where the Bible was saying that a woman should not depend on fashion, depend on a foundation to win her husband. She should not depend on makeup to win husband. Let me tell you, no matter the amount of makeup you put on your face, your husband will see somebody's makeup that is better than your own. But I don't want to go back to women. I need to go to men. But I wanted to go back in order to say, it is not in that outward. That's not where your strength is. The strength of the woman is not in her outward appearance. As beautiful as she may be, her strength is in her spirit. The Bible says the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. That's what the husband should be careful to not all, not to break. That inner ornament, that inner spirit, which whenever she's quiet and rested, she's of great price in the sight of God. I have come to know I've come to understand by experience, not only by seeing it in the word of God, that when a wife is rested in her husband's home, when she's not, she's not afraid, when she knows that she's loved, when she knows that she's completely accepted, the beauty inside of the woman comes out. That ornament comes out inner beauty of motherhood of oh know how to say it that inner grace of the virtuous woman comes out no woman can be virtuous when she has an abusive husband no woman can can come out in all the multicolored multi-sided uh, grace that god gives women they cannot come out when they have a husband who is shouting them down and beating them up or, 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 or relegating them to the background or pushing them aside. No, they will not come out. I'm sorry to say, sometimes women are like snail. You have seen a snail before. That thing that looks like a, you know, like a shell eh? inside that uh, is inside. All you see outside is the shell. Nobody is the shell. The shell is not useful. But when you want the snail to come out from inside the shell, you need to create a conducive atmosphere. An atmosphere of love, an atmosphere of care, and an atmosphere of honor. Delicate honor. Honor as well to dealing with somebody who is delicate, whose spirit can easily be broken. That's part of the knowledge we are talking about. Once a woman's spirit is broken, smash, 
she's unsettled. She can't do the things that she's supposed to do. She will not be able to do what she's capable of by God, by grace. There is the grace of being a mother, of being a wife. It's inside. It takes honor and delicate handling to pull that grace out. When you put a snail down, when there is noise and good, 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 and there is heat, the snail will never come out. It goes inside, inside, inside. And it goes to hide inside. No matter what you will have enjoyed, it will never come out. But if suddenly everywhere goes quiet and everywhere is cool and there is moisture, you will see the snail crawling out. It's crawling out of her shell. And as she's coming out, if she's coming out, you know, she sends out that uh, antenna on her, on her head. And she's doing like this. She's doing like this. If as the antenna goes, it touches something hot, what happens? It runs back. That's how women are. The grace inside of them needs a culturing. It needs an atmosphere to bring that woman out. I'm not talking about the fantasy that the Western world have tried to sell to us. I'm not talking about sweet tongue. I'm not saying, oh, honey, you are so sweet. Yeah, you look good to eat. But inside his heart, he has no respect for that woman. I'm not talking about just that outward thing that we do. You go and open a car, a car door for the wife so that she can come down and wish this woman should do something wrong. You shout her down. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a honor and a respect, a care, a loving care from inside to carry that woman as if I am carrying help. Because you are carrying your help. Time will not allow us to be talking about uh, some of those things. The, the capacity inside of a woman that the man will enjoy if he takes the wisdom of God to handle with care, handle with honor, handle with respect. Give her space. Even if she makes a mistake, who doesn't make a mistake? Bro, have you never made a mistake? Even if she does something wrong, don't shout her down. Allow her to make her mistakes. And then to gently correct her. I can tell you because I know the difference. I know when I used to shout on my wife. At the very beginning of our marriage, before I encountered this principle, if she does something like that, I will open my eye on her. Then when I have crushed her spirit, I will see her cry. And the wicked man that I was in those days, oh, may God forgive me over and over again. I will say, even if you are crying, that doesn't stop me. I will say, do my head and go out. Madam, let me tell you, even crying, it doesn't, it doesn't stop some men. It didn't stop me until I met the word of God. But all through that time, I did not know, I did not know the value, the, the, the riches that has been kept inside the wife I married. I didn't know there was so much to enjoy inside of her. If I gave her space, gave her honor, gave her respect, Give her care, lavish care on her. Allow her to feel that she's, she's loved. I just decided to love her lavishly. I identified with her everywhere I went to. I protected her. I made her like, excuse me, this is important to me. I don't believe in all those uh, face, face, uh, face, face saving things, but I'm talking about from the heart. You don't touch my wife and you will go anyhow. You, you will, I, I, will, I will stand up for her. Even in my family, by the grace of God, my family members can attest, I didn't allow anybody to run roughshod over my wife. They will try. In our culture, especially our own African culture, where the woman is a property of the, of the family. I, didn't, I said, no, I didn't marry this woman for the family. I married her by myself. Okay. Yes, I allow that to be a part of the family. I allow that to be a part of the culture. We are Africans, and we have to be African. When she goes to my parents' house, 
she works there, she does it. When there is an occasion, she's there like all other wives and all of that, but everybody knows their limit with my wife. Don't touch that woman or else you want to touch pastor. It is in that kind of atmosphere that a woman blows up. A woman is like a like flower. She has petals, beautiful petals inside. She's virtuous inside. She's gracious inside. But most of the time, your hot atmosphere cowers her in, crumpled her in. I see many women, I see their spirits crumpled. I say, hmm, this woman has not been allowed to express. This woman has not been allowed to come out. And you know, as pastors, just because I, we have the grace, and sometimes I, I want to treat her the way I'm treating my wife, to honor her because she's a woman. And then I suddenly see they will, they will, they will blows up. Sometimes I, I hear, I hear wives say, I have preachers say, uh, you don't obey your husband, you obey, you obey pastor. Maybe it's because sometimes the pastor, knowing the word of God, is doing right. But you as a husband, you are not doing right. Again, am I ex exonerating the woman? Am I asking her to to disrespect her husband because he's not doing right? Of course not. We are dealing with issues that concern each gender. The wife is a woman. She should be a woman. The husband should be a husband, should be a man, a man his home. As we go to the place of prayer tonight, I want you to know that the knowledge that it takes to run a successful home is not anywhere else apart from this word of God. You cannot have a successful home different from running your marriage according to the word of God. It is impossible to have joy and quietness and peace and happiness in your home without following these principles. I don't care what culture, I don't care what language, this is the same. There's a Bible in almost every language under the sun now. Thank God for men who are working to translate the Bible. They are doing a terrible, a, 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 a precious job, very good job, because everybody should have access to read the word of God in their own language. But even if you cannot read it in your language, there's a preacher preaching it to you in your language. There is no other way to have a successful home apart from this. Whether you are in Nigeria, you are in Syria alone, or you are in far away East Africa, whether you are in Canada or you are in Belize, no matter where you are, these principles are the same. I want to challenge you to get a correct home. Push away your culture. Follow the culture of the Bible. Even if you are dwelling in a white culture, a predominantly white environment, where CNN and all those uh, big, big uh, corporations are pushing down strange principles down our throat, I challenge you to push them aside and follow the word of God. And no matter where you are, even if you are in the Antarctic, you will have the happiness that the word of God offers. What I have even found out is that even when you find people who are not even born again, people who have not given their life to Christ, when they do something to, that is in semblance to what the word of God says, I see them still enjoying the beauty of marriage. I look at some of our old parents. I, I, I am old enough to have watched some of the generations of my grandparents. Watch old people relate. I see that the woman adores her husband. And I, when they do something to, that is in semblance to what the word of God says, I see them still enjoying the beauty of marriage. I look at some of our old parents. I, I, I am old enough to have watched 
some of the generations of my grandparents, what old people relate, I see that the woman adores her husband. And I see how the men carry their, their wife every morning. I used to see how my father, when my mother would come and greet him and kneel down and, and greet him, how he will, he will bless the woman from his heart. And he will say, you are, the, you, are the, you, are the, you are the mother of my children. You'll be the mother of my children till then. I see myself doing the same thing with my wife all the time. She wakes up, she says, ah, honey. And she kneels down beside me and, and greets me. She puts her head on my laps. I put my two hands on her head. I bless her. I pray for her. I can't do like that and finish and then start banging her head. Let me see you take the word of God. And apply it to your life. Apply it to your situation. And let us see. I will end with a, just a story. Before I, I drag you to the place of prayer. And I'm going to ask uh, one of our brothers to come and lead us uh, to pray. There was this woman. I was a pastor. I'm still a pastor by the grace of God. I was pastoring a local church several years ago. When we had this woman was brought to, to church. Her husband was beating and battering her every time. The man was so bad that he would bring girlfriends into the home and sleep with girlfriends on their matrimonial bed when his wife is in the house. That's the height of it. And of course, this woman showed wounds of how the man has beaten her. When she came, She's the first one that came to church. I said, the word of God says, submit to your husband. He said, ah, pastor, you don't know my husband. Submit. How can we? How can we? How can I? She, he's sleeping everywhere. He's doing this. He's doing that. I asked her, I said, do you do your matrimonial duties to your husband? He said, how can I do it to this guy? I said, ah, no. The Bible says, having a readiness to avenge all disobedience, when your own obedience is complete, go back home. Go and submit. I started teaching that woman. At first, of course, it was difficult. She said, no. She didn't. But as she stayed in the word of God in the, in the church, six months, maybe a year, and she was just coming to church, the word of God was going. Gradually, her heart was being overpowered by the word of God. Then she started changing at home. I did not even know. I just told her, I said, look, if you want your home to be settled, this is the word of God. And she started changing at home. She went to things she had never done before. She would carry the laundry of her husband, what she has never done for, for ages. She would carry them, push them in the... I don't think they even have a washing machine that time. She would wash, send them for laundry. She would do this. She would do that. Then one day when she came, she said, my husband is not changing. I said, ah. I said, don't worry. Don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap a result. I said, he said, can you imagine? He still brought a girl home. To I said, so when he brought the girl, what did you do? He said, ah, what else do you expect me to do? I, I, I poured water on the girl. I said, ah, that's not how to handle it. I said, he said, so what should I do? I said, go inside the kitchen. Go and cook. Man, cook for him and the girlfriend to eat. Huh? Pastor, I said, try it. The Bible says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Is that not what the Bible says? I don't know what entered into her head. I think it's the word of God. She decided to try it. So she, she the next time the, the man brought the girlfriend, she said, ah, my friend, ah, my girl, how are you? Ah, eh? what would you like to eat? She knew it was the girlfriend. He said, what oh, you like to eat? That one said, ah, eat. I don't want to eat. Ah, no, no, no. Relax. Your, my husband brought you home. You are, you are already my guest. She went inside. He went and food, uh, cooked food and brought it. Of course, the husband and the girl, they did not eat. They were afraid that something. But she didn't change. You know what happened? After, I don't know, maybe about a year or so, or several months. I don't think it was up to a year. Several months, the husband came to the office to come and see me. Ah, when she he came, everybody said, Ah, that man, the husband of that. I said, So bring him in. So they brought him in. He said, Pastor, um, I just want to come and thank you. I don't know what you are doing to my wife. Oh. 
But if she has been doing the way she's doing now, since I married her, ah, I'm not a madman now. Huh? I would not have been doing what I'm doing now. Eh? But uh, she's not reasonable. But now her head is coming down. Whatever you are doing to her, please continue to help me to do it to her. I say, eh. I say, but you come, you need to give. I say, eh, 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 I didn't come for you to preach to me. I just want you to help me to continue to preach to my wife. I say, it's okay. I say, but there's one thing I want to ask from you. I want you to help me tell your wife. And tell my wife. Then he looked, he said, Pastor, I hope nobody's hearing you. He said, the last thing that remains, my wife does not allow me to sleep with her often. Help me to tell her. If that one is finished, everything will be done. I laugh. Okay, of course. The next time I saw the wife, I spoke with the wife. And I said, do you know your husband? Your husband uh, said like this. He came here and he said, eh? what did he say? Eh? I said, no. Dude, this is the only thing remaining. He said, no, I cannot do it. To she that he is that sleeping around. Well, in those days, there was no AIDS yet. The only thing was uh, syphilis and gonorrhea at that time. He said, no, I don't want to carry. I, I said, no, don't. Uh, uh, this is right as a husband. If you give him, he will. Finally, she agreed. Of course, things started changing. I did not know. To cut a long story short, one day, he said, uh, that's your church that you are going. Let me, I, I want to carry you there. He didn't enter that day. He carried her dropped down in front of the church and went to the bar where he normally drinks on Sundays. The next Sunday, brought her to church. The following Sunday, brought her to church. He had been bringing her to church for about one month or two like that. Then one day, after dropping her in church, and he had turned back and he was driving away, the wife and the children, they had entered the church. Then she said, let me even go and hear what that pastor is saying. Sir. Of course, you know the end of the story. He came in, he sat down, and when I gave the other call, the husband was one of the first people that came out to give his life to Christ. I assure you it works. Try it. I want you to bow down your heads with me as we pray now. Go to God in prayer. Go and tell the Lord and say, Lord, I am ready to make my home to work. I want you to visit my home. I'm ready to make the word of God to come to pass in my life, to change my home. Go ahead and pray. Our brother will be coming to lead us to pray now. Brethren, I'd like us to cry unto the Lord tonight. The word of God has come to us. And I hear God says, I am here again. I want to help you. Can you cry unto the Lord tonight? Can you beg him tonight and say, Lord, you can do the same thing with me. Lord, you can come and do likewise in my home. I hear God speaking to wives. I hear God speaking to husbands. And I see God in his readiness to help us tonight. Can we cry unto him? In John chapter 6, verse number 60, when the disciple had God, they said, ah, this is a hard saying. Who can do this? Thank God that they received help of God and they were helped. Can you cry unto the Lord as a person? First of all, we have few minutes to cry unto the Lord tonight. I'd like us to pray, Lord, Lord, this understanding that you are bringing to me, Lord, I put myself in a position to harness it. Lord, this will become a testimony in my family. Can we cry unto the Lord? The Lord has been speaking to us. The Lord has been addressing issues that he wants us to adjust, that he wants to come and take complete, you know, that you want to come and take over completely. Can we cry to him tonight? Lord God of heaven, Lord, please send me help. 
Lord, save my life help. I know you can help me. Look at that beautiful stories that we had last. Can, can you also trust your family? Can you trust your wife? Can you, can you first of all pray or pray for yourself? Lord, send me help tonight. Can we cry unto the Lord? Can we cry unto the Lord? Lord, I am asking, please send me help this night. Lord, God of heaven, send me help. Lord, send me help. Send me help in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that you are requiring from me, Father, help me to give. Lord, all this demand that you have placed over my life as the head of the home, as the offer, Father, Lord God, I'm asking, please send me help in the name of the Lord Jesus. Please send me help in the name of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. While we are still in the mood of prayer, I had God said at the beginning of that message, he said there is a grace to us, you know, to, to be the husband of a wife. And there is a grace to be the wife of an husband. Can we cry unto the Lord tonight? This is the understanding, this is the knowledge the Lord is bringing to us. Can you hold the hand of your spouse where you are? And I want you to pray for one another. Let us pray. If God has been helping you before, I believe the Lord still, the Lord is still interested in helping you the more. And perhaps if it is because of you that God has come to us this year, and the God is saying, I can bring beauty out of the ashes of your home. Can we cry, Lord God of heaven, help my wife. Give me the grace to be a correct husband. Ability to dwell with her in knowledge. Ability to relate with my wife, oh God, in knowledge. Can we cry to the Lord tonight? Lord, release, oh God, unto my bosom. Father, can the wife also begin to pray, oh God, the grace, oh God, to be a correct wife. Can we cry unto the Lord tonight? For Lord, I am asking the grace to be a correct husband. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, the grace to lead my wife aright, the grace to love my wife, the grace to relate with my wife, oh God, in knowledge, oh God, so that all the beauty, oh God, all the good potential, Lord, that you have loaded inside of her, so that it can come, so that they can come and I can enjoy it, so that, my, so that my children can enjoy them. Oh, God, Father, in the name of God, please send help to my wife. I want you to pray for one another, brethren. Pray, oh, God. Lord, it is because of me that you are come. Lord, send me help tonight. Father, oh, God, I have that, oh, God, all the inner beauties, oh, God, all the potential.